Welcome back, fantastic friends and fans, to the third episode of the FanCast at Four podcast. My name is Dan Bettenhausen, and I am your host as we venture into the what-ifs of Marvel's first family and who will be appearing in the Marvel Cinematic Universe very soon. With Spider-Man director John Watts set to direct the Fantastic Four, rumors and speculation are flying around as to who will be playing the comic book royalty. But what if a different director was behind the camera? That is what we hope to explore in this podcast. Now, here is how the show works. Each episode will focus on one director who has never helmed an MCU film. Myself and a special guest will then fan cast a Fantastic Four film based on actors and actresses who the director has worked with previously and have also not been cast in a major MCU role. We will each be casting a Reed Richards, a.k.a. Mr. Fantastic, Sue Storm, a.k.a. The Invisible Woman, Johnny Storm, a.k.a. The Human Torch, Ben Grimm, a.k.a. The Thing, and their nemesis, Victor Von Doom, also known as Dr. Doom. After comparing lists, we will then give a pitch as to what that film may look like. To allow for a little more creativity, the film pitch does not need to be part of the MCU. If you wanna hear a brief history of the Fantastic Four, you can always check out our first episode where guest and show producer, Pat Bolfamonte provides a breakdown of each of the characters. With that said, let's meet this episode's guest. This week, I'm excited to have my friend Jack Mayer on this episode. Jack is a screenwriting major at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. He's also an avid film lover and may be the only person who loves 2019's Cats as much as I do. Jack, welcome to the podcast. I hope you're excited to be here. I cannot wait. As soon as you sent me the list of directors and I saw this one's name, I was like, I have to do this episode. I have to. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're excited. And uh, I think that's a perfect transition into introducing who this episode is focusing on. Regarding this director, I'll go over some of his highlights. He has 14 directorial credits in his filmography. He has one Best Director nom at the Academy Awards, one Best Original Screenplay nomination, and he may be best known for his crazy twist endings in the majority of his films. You probably guessed it. This week, we are examining M. Night Shyamalan. What a twist. (laughs) Jack, when you think of Shyamalan, what comes to mind first? The happening. I'm not even lying. (laughs) Here's the thing. Here's the thing about M. Night Shyamalan is that I think he is my favorite filmmaker because I both love his good movies for how good they are and love his bad movies also for how good they are. Uh, the Happening is my favorite M. Night Shyamalan movie. Uh, I was much more of a fan of old than most people were. I think that uh, the Eastro 177 trilogy is fantastic. You know, the only one of his who I'm not a really big fan of is The Last Airbender. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're jumping ahead a little bit. I We are going to get into our next segment, which I call Four Fantastic Films. Maybe laying it out if you have a specific order, feel free to say one, two, three, four, or just whatever order you want. What are your four definitively favorite M. Night Shyamalan films? Uh, Can I pull up my letterbox list for a second? Uh, Just because I did do a rewatch of all of Shyamalan's films last year. While we're at it, where can our fans find you on Letterboxd? You can find me at jmay658 on Letterboxd. Awesome. Everyone Uh, go check them out. uh, So here's my ranking. I'm going to go from four to one. So at number four, I actually do have old. Uh, I understand that there were people who were not fans of this movie. I understand why. However, the Shyamalanisms that bother people have never really bothered me because I find them entertaining enough to keep the movie going. I think that it actually displays him at his peak in terms of directing. I think that there are some really interesting shots and cinematography that he gets with this location. I really actually like the performances from especially Thomas and McKenzie, but also Gael Garcia Bernal. It's fantastic. So yeah, that's my number four. Awesome. So what's your number three? Number three, I have The Village, which I understand is also a bit of a hot take. Interesting. I saw this movie knowing the twist going in, and I do legitimately believe that it is a better movie for it. I think it's better knowing the twist of The Village going in you can pick up on a lot more of the intricacies of the story, of the performances from Joaquin Phoenix and Bryce Dallas Howard. Totally. I think that the horror elements work incredibly well in this film. They're very effective, at least for me. Yeah, yeah. And I think, weird to say when you're talking about a Shyamalan film, but I feel like this is one of the few that has aged better over time. I think when it first was released, it was not well-received. 
But surprisingly, again, for Shyamalan, this one has uh, a better shelf life. I think because people were expecting something different going in. True, uh, true. And no, that goes to your point about knowing the twist going in might actually help the viewing experience. It does, I, at least for me. And then I also just think that the romance is really sweet and very well written. Shyamalan doesn't often get enough credit, I think, as a writer sometimes. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you 100%. Yeah. So, okay, with that said, what's your second favorite Shyamalan film? The Sixth Sense. Um, I know that that's a bit more of a hot take. I think that is most people's number one film, but for me, it is number two. That being said, number two for Shyamalan is still fantastic. Uh, the use of red in this movie, it was something that I hadn't picked up on yeah. my first couple watches, but after talking to a friend and analyzing it using that color, and then also going back and watching other Shyamalan films and seeing how they use color, particularly Unbreakable, which is my number five, mm -hmm. I think that you see a lot of this early Shyamalan directing where he's so intentional about everything. I love the climax of this movie being a conversation between two characters in a car and yeah. the fact that there's no score to accompany it. It's just people talking and it feels so real. It just, it blows my mind when people don't think that Shyamalan is either a good writer or a director because maybe they haven't rewatched The Sixth Sense in a while. Maybe they've been tainted by The Last Airbender. Yeah, no, I mean, there's a reason uh, this film put Shyamalan on the map. It, I mean, from the big twist to the performances from a Haley Joel Osment, even a Bruce Willis before he really started uh, phoning. <laughs> and Tony Collette as well is phenomenal. Yeah, she, yeah she's great. She's great. And she's really starting to get her due as an actress, uh, maybe that she didn't get prior and around this time. So Although no, she I, did get nominated for this and rightfully so. Did she? Okay. Thank you for that reminder. And while you sit, you have it at two, if that's considered a hot take, I will say it's on my list, but it's not number one either. Be on the lookout. <laughs> <laughs> Still, we, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Jack, what is your favorite M. Night Shyamalan film? It's going to be The Happening, Jack. It's going to be The Happening. What a twist. <laughs> what, what about The Happening besides Mark Wahlberg talking to a ficus? Is, makes it your number one. I honestly believe that Shyamalan knew what he was making with this movie. There is no way that you can watch this movie and not think he wanted to make a comedy here. <laughs> but the fact that he does in interviews make it seem like he is going to be creating this horror masterpiece, the first R-rated Shyamalan movie, and then it becomes this, where a character is trying to calm another character down by telling them a math problem. Math it is out. so funny. I have seen this movie more times than I can count, and it has not gotten any less funny. It only gets better and better with more rewatches. It's amazing. It is an so amazing it, film. It's the cats of the Shyamalan filmography. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. People can hate it all they want, but we know the truth. We know the truth. We know the truth. However, we only have, as already alluded to, one similarity in our list, which I find very interesting. Oh, I do too. Um, but with that said, great list. That's what I love about being a fan of film is that we can disagree, but have great discussions about this. But without further ado, I will go through my top four Shyamalan films. Zero. At number four, I actually have split. Is the movie great? It is not. But I think it is so heavily carried by the performance of James McAvoy that I could just watch him in the movie all day long and enjoy it. I think this is really our introduction to Anya Taylor-Joy, which is great. Uh, I don't recall much that she did before this, but this is what the first thing I really remember her in. And I think this story and what we get at the end and what other films it ties into in Shyamalan's filmography is really great. And I think it was a nice surprise. Some people may have claimed they've seen, seen the twist ending coming. Even still, I think it was great. It fit. It was appropriate. Did it stick the landing in subsequent films? I don't think so. 
But I still, again, really based on James McAvoy alone, loved what he did in Split and made it my fourth favorite film of his. So understandable. Uh, I personally think that Split is the worst of the three East Trail 177 trilogy movies. Okay. Yeah, I just, I love Unbreakable, but I also really love Glass, which I also know yeah. is a bit of a hot take. That, that is more of a hot take than anything you've said to me so far, <laughs> I think. But... <laughs> Get, getting into what though speaking of hot take getting into what we were saying before six sense is actually my third favorite oh wow yeah, everything i don't think i can say much more than everything you had it's just i like these next two just a little bit more i think yes it launched it launched Shyamalan's career the performances are great i don't really want to be a broken record here so i'm not i'm going to move on to my second favorite which is actually signs i really enjoy signs i think it is a very effective alien invasion film the twist is twisty even for Shyamalan but I think the horror elements work I think the family elements work again you have a great performance by Joaquin Phoenix introduction of Abigail Breslin Mel Gibson I try not to think about him too much but <laughs> even still like uh, I think all in all signs a very effective follow-up to uh, what we've gotten from his previous two films before its release um and again i think this one of the scariest scenes for me that i recall is when they're watching that that found footage from the, this birthday party and you see the alien walk across the screen like everyone in the theater i remember jumping back one of the most effective uses of that device that i recall and while i'm not the biggest horror fan i can still appreciate when it's done effectively no, the birthday party jump scare still gets me as well. And I've seen the movie multiple times. Every time I just sort of lean back. <laughs> I know it's coming. I have the exact same reaction that Joaquin Phoenix does. Right. That... Again, the jump back. And and the scene where they're all sitting with their foil hats is is very, very, very adorable. And I think it adds a little bit of levity to what Shyamalan was going for, despite this horror background. It also has my favorite score in any Shyamalan movie easily. Oh, I yes. think it's that great. opening title sequence, I listen to that independently so often. It's just the build of it is so good. Awesome. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. And you had alluded to my first favorite film a little bit earlier, but it kind of, it does, it is one that does tie into Split. My, my number one favorite Shyamalan film is actually Unbreakable. I think in this time where we're dealing with superheroes so heavily in the film industry, it was very refreshing at the time of its release where we're getting some garbage to have a film that was independent of DC and Marvel and these big names. And it came from a completely different perspective. You had the tropes of a superhero movie being kind of explained to us and still tying in and interwoven in the story between David Dunn and Mr. Glass, played by Samuel L. Jackson. And I really am thankful for Shyamalan putting this out there and giving us superhero fans and comic book fans and the people probably listening to this podcast something a little bit different, a very kind of independent film feel to a superhero movie that isn't just Marvel and DC. And don't get me wrong, I love Marvel and DC stuff for the most part, but it was very, it was breath, breath of fresh air to get something like this um, from, from Shyamalan. And it's one that holds up even better Definitely. now. It has Definitely. aged so well in the time that we're in where we're seeing Spider-Man almost breaking $2 billion at the box office mm -hmm. and really. getting all of these Disney Plus shows. In a sense, it kind of does stand alone as a refutation of comic book movies, mm -hmm. but also as a celebration of them. I agree 100%. And that is why it's my number one favorite Shyamalan film. It takes a film genre that I love, twists it on its head in a good way, in a Shyamalanian way, and I'm very appreciative for that. So that's that. There are both of our favorite Shyamalan films. And with those films addressed, it is now time to get to the segment you've all been waiting for, the fan cast it casting. Here we will go through each character, pitching which actor or actress will be filling the shoes of the, the iconic Marvel character. First up is Mr. Fantastic himself, Reed Richards. Jack, I want to know who you are casting as Mr. Fantastic if you were M. Night Shyamalan. There are a lot of people who I could have chosen for this. There were several people I went back and forth on. 
but ultimately I think I had to go with Dev Patel. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Previously been cast in not the best Shyamalan movie. I don't know what you're talking about. It's not, it's not, not the best. It's not the best, but <laughs> Dev Patel has really proven himself to be a star, especially 2021's The Green Knight. Yes. Yes. Uh, you see a lot of this pain and agony and the idea of wanting to be a hero, which I feel like is an important characteristic for the smartest man in Marvel canon. So I went with Deb Patel for Reed Richards. Yeah, and I think something important about Reed too is he's a very driven character. He has he sets a goal and he will not stop until it's accomplished using his his brain or his powers. And that's something you see a lot, especially in maybe like a lion. Or as you'd mentioned, Green Knight. I think Dev Patel is certainly a leading man too that uh, would take charge as the lead in a Fantastic Four movie. So having him as a Reed Richards, I think, is a very great choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, Who did you pick? Well, it's thank you for asking. (laughs) 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 For for my Reed Richards, uh, the Mr. Fantastic, I'm going a little outside of the box here and i'm really not going to for all my castings i'm not going to reveal too much why i pick them until my pitch oh okay you'll you'll understand why you will understand why but for my mr fantastic i am taking jaden smith who played katai rage in 2013's after earth Talk about another Shyamalan favorite here. <laughs> I almost forgot about this film. Like I forgot he and Will Smith did this movie. It's crazy. I think Will Smith also wants to forget that he did this movie. That's probably true. You will again. You will see why I went with Jaden Smith in my pitch. I know I'm cheating a little bit with my own rules, but for now, Jaden Smith is my Mister Fantastic. AKA Reed Richards. He was but, great in the karate kid. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, that might come into play. Who knows? Now with every Reed Richards, you need a Sue Storm, an invisible woman. Jack, if you were M. Night Shyamalan, who is your Sue Storm? This was another toss up. Could have gone one way. Could have gone another. <laughs> Anya Taylor-Joy is my Sue Storm. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I think another inspired choice. Again, she is on the rise her star is ascending mm-hmm. and i think having not been cast in a marvel movie makes this easy she seems like someone that marvel is ready to nab ready to bring into their universe i know a lot of people are pitching her as black cat but i think that she would actually be a much better sue storm oh do you yeah i mean both her and anything I and mean, she's she's a chameleon she can do whatever whatever she wants. If she wants to be Black Cat, go for it. It, I also think she'd be a great Sue Storm. So I think an inspired choice. And I'm going to follow this up by saying, I asked you for your casting before, just so there wasn't a lot of crossover. Four of your five choices were on my list. So I had to completely change. Granted, I am thrilled with the direction I went, but you and I were very much in sync with these castings so far. Mm -hmm. So very excited for this option. Anya Taylor-Joy is a great choice, great actress. And no, I agree. I think she has the capability of doing everything that comes with being a Sue Storm. Yeah, for sure. For me, with my revised list, again, not going to go into too much detail why I'm making this pick, but I'm going with an actress who was in 2002 Signs. She played the character Bo Hess, the daughter of Mel Gibson's character. I'm going with Abigail Breslin. She was my toss-up with uh, Anya <laughs> Taylor-Joy, actually. Again, she she's definitely, I wouldn't want to say fallen off the map, but she has not nearly done as much lately as she did when she was a younger actress with Zombieland, Little Miss Sunshine, Signs. But I still think she's a very good actress. She's got the chops to be in a Marvel movie. But again, without wanting to spoil too much, I'm going to leave it there. Excellent. And with Sue Storm, you have her brother, Johnny, the Human Torch. Jack, I want to know who your Human Torch is if you were M. Night Shyamalan casting a film. This was the easiest casting. I thought there was no one else who could play it other than Alex Wolf. Yeah, great choice. Uh, he was really good in old, I thought, but where he stands out and where he shines is hereditary. Yeah. And seeing 
the torment and the torture that he has to go through in that film, I feel like he can bring that sort of inner turmoil to Johnny and to the Human Torch. Well, and also when you have The Rock playing you in a Jumanji movie, I think it shows you have the energy to be someone fiery like the Human Torch. That you is true too. Jumanji. <laughs> can't, you can't. You can't skip Jumanji. You can't skip lunch. Of course. <laughs> uh, for, for me, I'm going to take an actor you've already chosen. Your Reed Richards is actually going to be my Johnny Storm. Okay. I'm going with Dev Patel as the Human Torch. I'm going to sound like a broken record, something I'm trying not to do, but I'm not telling you why he is my Human Torch. Oh, like you're, just, you're just building anticipation I, yeah, for your no. pitch now, Dan. I know this it's is, not. Gonna, it is not going to live up to this pitch, but that might be perfect Shyamalan movie. Not <laughs> up to the story that you're you're presented at first, but again, it, there's it's never wrong to cast Dev Patel in something. Uh, I don't know if you recall when we did the best heroes and villains uh, general debate in the Action Army. I had cast him as as my uh, Professor Xavier. There's never a wrong time to cast. Dev Patel in anything. Dev Patel can do anything. He really can. Okay. So again, you'll have to wait and see why he is my human torch. But oh, and I guess for those who aren't who do try and forget or have forgotten, he did play Prince Zuko in 2010's The Last Airbender. Why did you say that name? Sure did. So I, I can see sure Pat, did. Pat off screen here shaking and and convulsing convulsing <laughs> uh, at hearing that that film's title, but. Let's leave it there. I don't want him to get physically ill hearing that that, Pat, about that film anymore. Pat, don't worry. I'm right there with you. <laughs> well, every week I say the same thing about this character, Ben Grimm. I think he is the glue. He is the thing. He is the one that keeps this team together. So I'm curious, Jack, who do you have in this pivotal position as Ben Grimm in a Shyamalan Fantastic Four film? And when you have the glue, you need the person who has given the best performance in any Shyamalan film. So I'm going with Haley Joel Osment as Ben Graham. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Is, does he see dead people in this film? He might. <laughs> he, he very well might. You'll have to wait and see in the pitch. But well, I mean, if he does enough clobbering, they might be dead at that point. Maybe <laughs> so. No. What are your thoughts on Haley Joel Osment now as an actor compared to, I mean, he was with AI and Sixth Sense, like he was, his star was bright. To be fair, I wasn't alive when this <laughs> <That's been laughs> came out. Uh, but seeing those movies now, Sixth Sense and AI, you can just see how talented Haley Joel Osment is, how restrained he can be, but how much he can let out. He is so, so good. He's got such a sweet nature to him as well, which is, I think, important for Ben Grimm as well. Yeah. Totally. He's my pick. I feel like, honestly, Marvel should cast him in this, even if they don't end up doing our insane shovel on pitches. And again, you you have like the prototype in a Michael Chiklis where he looks like the thing without the rock, the rock features. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about technology these days, you can take any actor and CGI them to look like the thing. Exactly. So, That's what they did with Jamie Bell and Fan Forsyth. <laughs> We also don't talk about that movie too much. On yeah, this I think I might have killed Pat with that one. <laughs> but so we can take actors who might not generally think of as Ben Grimm and put them in this role because they have the personality for it. And I think you can certainly get away with it and even excel in it with a Haley Joel Osment. Great. I'm going back to my, my favorite Shyamalan film. No, I am not casting Bruce Willis as the thing. Though he does kind of look like Michael Chiklis in some regards. I'm actually casting the actor who played his son, Joseph, Spencer Treat Clark, as the thing. For a second, I thought, he's going to pick Robin Wright as the thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm going with Spencer Treat Clark. Granted, he did have a minor role in the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, television show, but I don't consider that a major MCU role. So it counts. And this is my show, and I can make up the rules. Again, you will hear why I have gone with Spencer Treat Clark in my pitch, because I don't want to give the twist away too soon. That's no fun for any of us, but Spencer Treat Clark is my the thing. And again, any good team of heroes needs a villain. Jack, who is the nemesis of this Fantastic Four film you're casting? Who is your Doctor Doom? Doctor Doom. I want to clarify that. Just Doctor Doom. Okay. It's played by Adrian Brody. Okay. 
I thought about this one for a little bit. There were a lot of veteran Shyamalan actors that I considered for this role. I really almost put Joaquin in there. Yeah. But then that got me thinking about the village and thinking about Adrian Brody's performance in the village, how he can be ultimately kind of a villain in that movie, but so sympathetic and so understanding. I think that he would bring a level to Dr. Doom that we haven't previously seen. I think that he's got the right look for it. Yeah. I think he can be intimidating when he needs to be, but I think he can also make people trust him. No, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, there's a reason he's an Academy Award winning actor. Absolutely. You've seen, him, you've seen him play a little maniacal in like a succession. You've seen him as an action hero in Predators. I think he can do it all. And I don't think he's an actor that's, pretentious enough that wouldn't mind wearing the mask if that's where your pitch is going absolutely i also just think about his roles in wes anderson movies oh yes i think that's kind of the vibe that i would get from his doctor doom a little bit especially because it's a Shyamalan movie and i feel like yeah. he would probably have his villain played be played a little bit more restrained but totally. i, no, I want to hear i want to hear yours now yeah so this might knock you out of your seat a little bit i'm afraid for pat here my Doctor Doom, and I will admit, one thing I will give away is not going to have a big role in my film. My Doctor Doom, though, is going to be played by M. Night Shyamalan. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Had just left. <laughs> Oh my god. That was uh that was yes, the director himself who has appeared in many, if not all of his films, most of his films. He has will be playing the main not the main protagonist in my film, but the a protagonist, Dr. Doom, in this film. And again, while I throw out the the treat a little bit. I'm going to reel you in with my pitch, I promise. Oh, so good. That's so good. <laughs> um, I mean, he's not a good actor. He's cameos in most of this. And that's really what this is going to be. We're going to have a Shyamalan cameo as Dr. Doom in my film. Oh, excellent. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> well, there you have it. That is both of our lists, both of our castings for an M. Night Shyamalan Fantastic Four film. And now it's time to actually pitch those films that these characters will be playing in. Jack, before getting into your pitch, I have two questions for you. Yes. First, is your film an origin film? Yes. Okay. Awesome. I'm excited to see where this goes. Second, is your film part of the MCU? It is. Oh, even better. I think you are the first person so far who has definitively said this is part of the MCU. And I'm a little concerned, being that this is M. Night Shyamalan directing an origin MCU film but I'm also that much more excited to hear what you have to say. So without me holding you back, go ahead and pitch your M. Night Shyamalan Fantastic Four film. Okay, so first of all, I would like everybody here to know that I wrote out an entire pitch. It breaks down the entire plot of the movie, and it's five pages long. So strap in. I am impressed. I am impressed. First, I mean, not just with you, but with all of our guests. And you are just like following in line from all of them with putting full commitment into these pitches. So good luck. Good luck reading this. Good luck going through this. And I am excited to hear what you have to say. All right, you ready? I am. Open on a desolate apartment in New York City. The film begins with a prototypical Shyamalan tracking shot, moving through the barren space and showing photographs of the Storm family. Eventually we come to the living room where Sue Storm sits on the couch alone. On the table in front of her are newspapers from five years ago talking about what else? The snap. Sue looks down at them, then out of the window. She turns back around when suddenly there's someone else in the apartment. Her hands go to her mouth in shock as she sees Johnny Storm standing there, confused. Sue stands and slowly walks towards him, making sure this is indeed real. And because this movie is, of course, written, directed, and produced by M. Night Shyamalan, the opening four lines go as follows. Johnny. Sue? Sue. Johnny? Johnny. You're older. Sue, you're the same age. The two embrace in a hug. It seems as though all is well until Johnny, who at this point is facing the window, exclaims, what in the hell is that? 
Sue turns as well, and the two see Thanos' ship from Endgame high in the sky, firing down on Avengers base. Not looking at Johnny, Sue says, I don't know, but I think we better hide. Cut to the Marvel Studios logo and fanfare. That's our opening. After that, one year later appears, and we're back in New York City. Only now, we're following Reed Richards and Ben Grimm, racing down sidewalks and pushing past people, desperate to get somewhere. This sequence, of course, also features incredibly natural, subtle dialogue, such as, don't you think you're stretching yourself too thin, Reed? And there's no way they'll go for it. We're going to get clobbered. Things we all say in our everyday life. Nonetheless, Reed and Ben make it to their meeting, which it turns out is with Stark Industries, because, you know, if there's one thing MCU fans still want this universe to be about, it's Tony Stark. Reed and Ben present a pitch to the board, which, by the way, includes M. Night Shyamalan as a member, because Cameo's got a cameo. And they basically say that they want to run experiments on the nanotech gauntlet that Tony Stark used to snap away Thanos. In Reed's words, if that technology could hold the power to destroy life, imagine what else it can do. It is also at this point that the board reveals something shocking. This research was being conducted for several months by a man named Victor Von Doom before his untimely death. The board allows for Reed and Ben to continue Von Doom's research with a few caveats. First, they must hire at least one intern. Stark Industries swears they had one before, but they all seem to have forgotten who it was. And second, because it's a Shyamalan film, their research will be conducted at a Stark Industries facility somewhere in the Philadelphia area. It's a remote location, the board member played by Shyamalan explains. Only one other major scientist works there. You'll meet him. His name is Christoph Bernard. After their meeting, Reed and Ben go through a list of potential interns to hire, where the names Felicia Hardy and Harry Osborne are both dropped. Eventually, however, they contact Sue Storm. She meets with the two, and there's Shyamalan chemistry between her and Reed, which is, of course, a lot of blank staring at one another while saying deadpan lines about seemingly relevant things. I really, I'm imagining a scene uh, where she comes over to their apartment and they've cooked for her, and Reed and Sue have a really long conversation about pasta that's intended to be the beginning of their romance. <laughs> Sue agrees, uh, but has her own condition that Johnny has to go with him. Uh, in her words, he's still in shock from the snap. This could be a healing experience for him. The four travel to Pennsylvania to this location where Kristoff is waiting to greet them. He briefly shows them around the facility until they get to the nanotech gauntlet, which, after they walk away from it, begins to spark. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, Joshua Ayers performs a magic show that wows a crowd into paying him an obscene amount of money which is then revealed to be the work of Ayers' partner, Philip Masters, a man who was able to create puppets of people in the crowd. Just for reference, Joshua Ayers is played by Aaron Pierre, who played mid-sized sedan in the movie Old. <laughs> and Philip Masters is, of course, played by uh, the happening and succession cast member, Jeremy Strong. Awesome. One night, a bit later, when Reed, Sue, Johnny, and Ben are synthesizing the gauntlet, it begins to misbehave again. Reed, on the very first try, without any other guesses, exclaims, there must still be some leftover cosmic energy from the Infinity Stones. Reed jumps in front of the gauntlet, extending himself in an attempt to absorb the blow, but the gauntlet blasts all four of them, knocking Ben back into a table of rocks, Johnny next to an open flame, and Sue into glass. In true Shyamalan fashion, we have reached the end of Act 1. Everything has been clunkily set up for what's to come. That's yeah. end of Act 1. Are you ready for, for you to go oh. on? Oh, there's more. Oh, there's, oh, there's so oh, much no more. That was that was, that that was, was the, not how many pages are we through? <laughs> that's about a page. Please, okay, I, I will shut up then. Please keep going. <laughs> Act two begins as the characters wake up with a newfound set of powers. The powers of the Fantastic Four, of course. Christoph has come into the room after the gauntlet combustion, but merely watches as the four examine their new powers, and it's a mess. Johnny accidentally throws fireballs everywhere. Reed can't control his arms. Sue goes in and out of visibility, and Ben is getting used to his new body. This event at the Stark Lab has caught the attention of Joshua and Philip, and Joshua says, this could be the miracle they're waiting on. As Act 2 goes along, the four, along with the help of Kristoff, learn to control their powers and work together. Reed and Sue grow closer, which makes Johnny feel left behind by Sue and Ben feel left behind by Reed. Johnny proceeds to spell out his emotions very obviously, saying things such as, I was gone for five years, and now I've been back for one year, and you've already forgotten about me. It's also very important that Johnny says year twice in this style of dialogue, because how else is Shyamalan going to communicate just to the audience? I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> They'd never figure it out without that. Uh, meanwhile, Ben Grimm has the same problem he has every Fantastic Four movie. I don't look like a human anymore. But Reed, of course, tells him, you're not a thing. You're Ben. This midpoint explosion of the group causes both Johnny and Ben to leave. 
where they see Joshua and Philip planning an attack on the facility. The two try to stop them, but Philip has already made puppets of the four, easily controlling Johnny and Bennett's submission. Much like the original Iron Man, this midpoint fight is our first major action sequence, as Joshua, now under the guise of Miracle Man, and Philip, the puppet master, break into the lab, knock Kristoff out, manipulate Reed and Sue, and steal the nanotech gauntlet. Reed and Sue find Johnny and Ben, and along with Kristoff, help them to get back to their health. Kristoff tells the four that Miracle Man and Puppet Master will almost certainly use the gauntlet's powers, as well as their own tactical manipulation of other super beings to rip the world apart, just as the multiverse almost did. They decide that tomorrow they must stop Miracle Man and Puppet Master. That night, Reed and Sue have more awkward dialogue, probably about pasta again, to tie it full circle, and the two kiss. End of act two. Act three begins as Miracle Man and Puppet Master, aided by Puppet Master's stepdaughter Alicia, played by Thompson McKenzie, are priming the gauntlet, getting it ready to go. It is also here that it is revealed that the two are working for someone that is not revealed whom yet. All that is said is, you remember what he told us, open the universe, let them all out. The four plus Kristoff, thanks to cosmic energy tracking, something that's totally a real thing and Shyamalan didn't invent in order for the plot to get where it needed to go, totally. find Miracle Man and Puppet Master who have already begun harvesting the gauntlet's energy. The four realize they need to take out Puppet Master's dolls first in order to stand a chance. They determined that because he was not manipulated in the previous battle, there is no Kristoff doll. While the four distract the villains, Kristoff destroys the puppets. During the battle, Alicia gets blinded and Ben rushes to her aid. There's a big battle that happens as the four work together to defeat the two. And at this point, I know what you're probably thinking. Wait, it's a Shyamalan movie. Where's the twist? Where is the twist? Here it is. The four take out Puppet Master and Miracle Man, but it's revealed that they were merely pawns for the real villain. Kristoff, which to comic fans isn't really a twist. I mean, this character was established as taking over the Dr. Doom mantle in the comics, but that's where the second big Shyamalan twist comes in because yeah. Kristoff isn't actually Kristoff. As what? Reed once again figures out on the very first try, oh my God, he's a variant of Victor Von Doom, a multiverse Von Doom that was brought into this dimension who commanded an army in his universe and is set on bringing them into this earth. As the interdimensional army starts to cross over, Johnny realizes that he can stop them, but it could result in his death. Sue begs him not to, but he turns to her and says, I've already died once. It wasn't so bad. He thanks Ben, tells Reed to take care of Sue, and closes the dimension as the other three send Von Doom back to his dimension, weak and near death. Johnny collapses, pulling from the comic storyline three, but does not die. Alicia reveals that she can manipulate the voodoo doll, same as her dad, or her stepdad, and revives Johnny. The story concludes with the four presenting their findings to Stark Industries, recommending that the gauntlet be destroyed and walking away together as the Fantastic Four. Wait, there, there's, there's more? In a mid credit scene, the four are in Sue's apartment, everything seeming to be normal, when there is a knock at the door. Sue answers, and a man says, I'm looking for Reed Richards. Sue is shocked. The rest of the four come to see who it is. Victor Von Doom, played by Mark Wahlberg. What a twist! <laughs> okay. Yep. In a post-credit scene, the planet Hala is shown. Cree soldiers and other residents are going about their day when the world is suddenly cast into shadow, a galactus-shaped shadow. Cut to black. The Fantastic Four will return. And scene. Wonderful, amazing, and ultimately a fantastic pitch. I jumped the gun after act one. I thought you were just teasing the movie. No, you went all out. You have a full film there. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm i extremely, I don't know if you know, I'm ex extremely speechless on what I just heard. It sounds extremely Shyamalanian, which is the exercise that, I again, I commend you for your efforts. How, how long did that take you to put together? A couple hours. Holy, Pat, Pat you're, I, Pat's here. He looks like he's dying to say something. Pat, what do you, what do you have to say? I mean, I, I'm, I'm absolutely impressed at how deep you went into the Fantastic Four lore from the comics. Like, you pulled out Puppet Master, Miracle Man, you have the second Doctor Doom, you referenced uh, Hickman's uh, Fantastic Four 3 storyline from the comics. I'm just... Uh, it's, my hat is off to you, sir. Good job. <laughs> oh, man, that... Uh, 
week after week, my guests step it up. And I am proud as a host that I have found some great people committed not only to their pitches, but to the directors in which they are making a film around. So well done, Jack. Again, my pitch is not living up to this. And for time's sake, I'm probably going to give you the truncated version of this, just so you're all can, you know, go home at a decent hour. <laughs> so, so for my pitch, there are actually, I'll say near the end, there are some parallels, which I'm excited to see that there are a little bit of, a little bit of crossover, but all in all, my pitch starts with the movie itself is called Four. Hold Chama, on, wait, question. Yes. Is there an origin story? Yes and no. Does it take place in the MCU? No, hell no. <laughs> well, if we're count like again with the multiverse, anything could, anything is possible. But in more sense than not, no, it is not an MCU film. Okay. For my pitch, it's it's called Four. Shyamalan likes going for the most part with like one or two word films. So this is just called Four, because why not? And this film opens with the Earth as we see it attacked by the scroll. In the MCU, the scroll aren't considered necessarily evil, but the Earth is under siege from scroll aliens. Mm -hmm. And we shift to this laboratory where we see the bodies of the Fantastic Four in these tubes. And you see Dr. Doom, again, played by Manite Shyamalan, uh, being examined. And he's like, We have to get them back. We have to bring them back. Oh, oh, Dr. Doom is trying to bring back the Fantastic Four. We are led to believe have died on this earth. So Dr. Doom, through some awesome Shyamalan exposition, is like, we need someone who knows about the scroll. And that's, he starts looking through this list of names. He starts, this viewfinder keeps spanning back and forth where he comes up to Jaden Smith's character, uh, uh, Katai, rage in the after earth series who in that movie fight the aliens called the skrell aliens so in this universe after earth the sprell are the same as the skrull and you see jane smith's consciousness leave the body of the after earth universe and get transplanted into the body of reed richards on our current earth with dr doom or as I will call him, Shyamalan Doom. We pan over to Sue Storm's body, and we go then to Dr. Doom, going through looking for different versions of Sue that's for someone who could replace Sue Storm. And in signs, as we know it, there, it's an alien story. We need someone who can fight off aliens. What's Sue Storm's power? Fighting things off with clear, uh, translucent energy. What kills the aliens in signs? Water, a clear substance. So he takes the consciousness of an older Bo Hess who is grizzled now after fighting aliens and knows how to use water to stop them and transports her consciousness into this Sue Storm's body. Now we get to Johnny Storm. What kind of bender is Prince Zuko? In the last, oh, Jack's raising his hand. Jack, Jack, I call on you. What he's kind a, of? Bender? He's a firebender. He's a firebender. She's part of the Fire Nation. Yes, and Johnny Storm is the Human Torch. He manipulates and controls fire. So Doctor Doom then takes the consciousness out of Prince Zuko and transports it into the body of Johnny Storm. And now, what you might think? Oh, Bruce Willis is David Dunn is the unbreakable character. Sorry for spoiling. I'm going to spoil Glass. He died in Glass. But we so learn that his son, Joseph, got his powers over time. It developed when he was an adult. He didn't necessarily have them as a kid. They developed as an adult. So Shyamalan Doom is looking through the multiverse and finds Joseph Dunn taking up his father's mantle as the unbreakable man. What's the thing? Rock hard, pretty much unbreakable. So he takes the consciousness. I sound, again, very much like a broken record, but takes Joseph's consciousness and transplants it into the thing. So now the Fantastic Four is back, retaining all both memories of their home 
and the Fantastic Four on this earth. So they can be both. It's like a split thing too. They're, they're dual lives in one body of the old Fantastic Four. And with the knowledge that Katai has or Reed and now has of the scroll, he te- they all team up with Dr. Doom, Shyamalan Doom, to defeat the scroll. And it ultimately ends in a conflict with the Super Scroll. For those of you who do not know who the Super Scroll is, it is a transmogrification of all the Fantastic Force powers into one scroll entity. And if I f- mess that up, Pat will correct me later. In the middle of the movie, some conflict is once these Fantastic Four are off trying to learn their new bodies and memories and the conflict there, the scroll take the technology that Dr. Shyamalan Doom had to take the consciousness. So they take the consciousness of the beast played by James McAvoy and put it in the super scroll to add to its powers. So not only does it have the power of the four Fantastic Four characters, it also has all the different personalities and powers that the beast has from the split and glass film. I see your mouth open agape, Jack. I'm not sure where to go. <laughs> Pat looks like he wants to die. So <laughs> That so, is my Avengers Endgame. <laughs> so the ultimate conflict is these new Fantastic Four uh, fighting off the Super Scroll and the rest of the scroll. Now, we don't have a, a mid-credit, but we do have a post-credit scene where, like yours... We see, we, it's not ha- Hala, but over Earth, we don't see Galactus yet, but we see the Silver Surfer zip in from the depths of space, looking upon Earth in the distance. The Silver Surfer here is then played by Haley Joel Osment, who looks upon the Earth and just through exposition says, I am the Silver Surfer, Herald of Galactus, and I see dead people. And the film ends. That is not the end, though. There is a second post-credit. So didn't want to do uh, this Shyamalan here. We're not going with convention. There are two post-credit scenes. In the midst of their victory, we see Doom sitting, relieved that his plan had worked. But the mask comes away and the tone shifts. We see Shyamalan in a boardroom talking to the Kevin Feige and the producers of Marvel saying, okay, so you're going in this with this multiverse. Here is how we can bring the Shyamalan multiverse into the MCU. And that is the end of the film is Shyamalan actually pitching the Shyamalan universe as part of the whole MCU multiverse and scene. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that movie 20 times opening weekend. Oh, well, I, I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> Again, we we went in some different directions, but both still yeah. very, very Shyamalanian, both equal merit in their own M. Night Shyamalan-ness. Yes, very much so. Pat, would you uh, watch either of those movies? <clears throat> I would watch both of those movies for very different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think you'd ultimately walk away feeling similar things. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Man, we got through it. We did it. Our and we broke path. <laughs> we did. And we may break some listeners. So I apologize not in advance, after after the fact, if you listen to these, if you survive through it, twist and all, but I'm proud of you, I'm proud of us, and we did it. And again, these movies aren't going to be made, so it's fun to dream, but dream on, my friends, dream Man, on. If I could make four happen, I would, though. <laughs> if I could make yours happen, I totally would. Oh, man. I mean, granted, none of these can be any worse than what we've gotten when it comes to the Fantastic Four. So why not just go, why not lean into it? Yeah. But anyway, that is the end of our episode. We survived. We did it. And I hope you enjoyed our fan castings and our pitches for M. Night Shyamalan and his Fantastic Four movie. We hope you, the listeners, enjoyed our exploration into this what-if scenario. Big twists and all. 
I want to make special note that the Fancast at Four podcast is hosted for free on Anchor. We encourage you, if you have your own podcast idea, to check out Anchor. It is a great resource for getting your ideas off the ground. You can find us also on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are listening on YouTube, we would greatly appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and commenting with who your Shyamalan fan cast would be, on what your thoughts of our lists are, what your thoughts on our pitches were, and which director you want to see next. Finally, I want to thank our producer, Pat Bolfamonte, for his hard work. And I also want to make sure to thank Matt Hart and Maddie Gunner for the fantastic theme music they created for us. Jack, thank you again for being on our show. I hope you had a good time. I had a great time. Thank you for having me on. My absolute pleasure. Hope to see you again soon with a different director. Oh, you will. <laughs> great, great. Well, that is our show. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Dan Bettenhausen. And on behalf of my friend, Jack, I hope you all have a fantastic day.